You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Today I present you with the second in my three-part series on Lamar's Iowa. In the last podcast, I told you about Lamar's lawyer T.M. Zink and his desire to have a womanless library constructed 75 years after his death. Now, if you haven't heard that story yet, I encourage you to listen to that episode first. The events of today's story may never have happened if Zink had written a more typical will. For most people, the Great Depression begins with the stock market crash on October 24th of 1929. Yet, for the rural farmers of the Midwest United States, their depression began shortly after the end of World War I. Up until this point, farmers were enjoying ever-growing production and profits, and of course greater profits allowed them to purchase more acreage and to purchase more equipment. But that also meant taking on more debt. And as with most financial bubbles, the farmers were headed for a big crash they were suddenly hit with a triple whammy. That's because to run efficient farms, they needed expensive machinery. But mechanization created overproduction, and if you have too much product, you get sudden price deflation. While industry could simply lay off workers and idle manufacturing plants, the farmers lacked a similar option. That's because farm employees were typically family members, not hired hands. Of course, livestock still requires food and care, and idle land means no money coming in to continue paying those hefty farm loans. Farmers were already suffering badly when Black Tuesday hit. Prices for produce and meat suddenly plummeted, and farmers could no longer afford to pay their bills. Perhaps no other family portrayed this farming crisis better than the family of Edward Durbin Sr., his farm was in Struble, Iowa, which is just a short distance north of Lamar's. When Ed died on November 20th of 1932, no one could have ever imagined that his farm, or at least what was left of it, would put Lamar's right back on the front page of newspapers across the country. And that's just two years after that bizarre request for a womanless library did the same exact thing. Before I tell you why Lamar's was once again thrust into the spotlight, I should probably back up a bit and tell you more about Ed Durbin. He first came to Struble in the 1880s and he operated a grocery store and an implement shop. He gained great wealth as a savvy businessman and he soon started buying and selling farmland. As for that land bubble prior to the end of World War I, Ed got caught up in it in a very big way. Along with partner William Nicholson, in 1919, the two landed one of the county's largest land deals up to that point. 1,600 acres was purchased for $375 per acre for a grand total of $600,000. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $8.5 million today. But very quickly, things started to go sour. Durbin sold about 620 acres of the land to a guy named John Ney for $415 per acre, which would have resulted in a profit of $24,800 or $350,000 adjusted for inflation. But it was never to be. That's because Ney reneged on the deal. One can only guess that was due to the sudden plummet in land prices following the war, and the whole ordeal ended up in court. Now, Durbin was in need of a good lawyer. Hmm, let's think about this. Who can he hire as a good lawyer in Lamar's, Iowa? Any suggestions? Oh, you guessed it. He hired that misogynist attorney, T.M. Zink. Well, perhaps he should have found a better lawyer. That's because they lost. Well, the case was appealed, and in 1923, the state Supreme Court ruled against Nye and awarded Ed Durbin $34,382.80 plus interest. At first glance, it seemed like Ed Durbin was now sitting pretty. Not only did he still own the land, but the court had awarded him more money than he would have originally seen in profit had the deal really gone through. But that was not how it played out. Durbin owed the Northern Trust Company $171,049.86 
and of course that bubble had burst. There was just no one to sell all that land to. So in 1924, the court declared that he was in default of the loan, and Durbin lost the land. And things only went downhill from there. Desperate for money, Ed Durbin was forced to mortgage 480 acres of his 640-acre farm. But even that didn't work. He soon lost it all. The last 160 acres, which included the family home, was placed into receivership and sold in a sheriff's sale on the Lamar's courthouse steps. The buyer? None other than lawyer T.M. Zink. Whether Zink purchased a Durban farm to help out an old friend or to simply make a profit is really anyone's guess. The one thing that is certain was that Ed Durbin no longer owned the land, and he now had to pay T.M. Zink rent to continue operating his own farm. You already know what happened next. T.M. Zink died in 1930, and his will was invalidated, leaving his daughter Margareta Becker as the sole heir to his estate. Ed Durbin's 1932 death placed the operation of the farm into the hands of his son, Ed Jr., the deepening depression soon meant that the younger Durbin was unable to earn enough from the farm's operation to pay the annual rent to Margreta and her husband Clarence. The Beckers, in turn, had no choice but to seek a new tenant. A man named George Schaefer offered to rent the land, which meant that the Durbins were about to be evicted. The Durbins were not alone in the loss of their farm. Between the years 1926 and 1931, get this, one out of every seven Iowa farmers lost their land. Average land values had dropped from its 1920 high of $254 per acre on average to $68 per acre in 1932, placing the majority of farm mortgages underwater. Their mortgages remained high and unadjusted, but it became nearly impossible to operate a farm for profit. Let me give you some examples. It cost farmers 92 cents to grow a bushel of corn if they're only able to sell it for 32 cents at market. A 49 cent bushel of oats brought in 16 cents at market. And the break-even point for butterfat was 30 cents per pound, yet the selling price was only 16 cents. Farmers were desperate and needed a way to bring their problems to the attention of elected officials in Washington, D.C. Their approach was simple. They were going to stop shipping meat, milk, and produce to the cities, you know, basically starve them out, and soon the federal government would have no choice but to resolve the farm situation. They figured that if bankers could shut down for a period of time to prevent a run on their reserves, you know, take what was known as a banker's holiday, so could the farmers. So under the guidance of former Iowa Farmers Union President Milo Reno, the Farmers Holiday Association was formed on May 3rd of 1932. Their slogan was, stay at home, buy nothing, sell nothing. Starting in August 1932, the Iowa farmers did exactly what they said they would do. They withheld their products from market. Roads were blocked, picket lines were set up, and a lot of noise was made. And yes, there was some violence, but it didn't work. Instead of prices increasing, they dropped even further. That's because buyers simply purchased their livestock in other markets. By mid-September, this phase of their protests had basically ended. It was a failure. Things were quiet for the next few months. Then, on January 4th, 1933, an estimated 1,000 farmers showed up to protest the foreclosure of a farm which was owned by John A. Johnson. The only bidder for the farm during the proceedings was its mortgage holder, the New York Life Insurance Company. They bid $30,000 for the property. The mortgage had been for $33,000, which meant that Johnson would still have been on the hook for the remaining $3,000. The protesters pleaded with the company's lawyer, Herbert S. Martin, to raise his bid, 
but he claimed that he wasn't authorized to do so. So the crowd grew increasingly angry, and as one farmer dangled a noose, shouts were made such as lynch the bloodsucker and hang him on a tree. Fearing for his life, Martin contacted New York Life, and they agreed to pay the additional $3,000. The threat of violence finally grabbed the attention of elected officials. County lawyers declared that they would suspend all foreclosure proceedings until after February 13th. On February 8th, the Iowa legislature passed a Mortgage Moratorium Act, and Governor Clyde L. Herring went one step further and requested that mortgage and insurance companies postpone their foreclosures. Everything seemed quiet until April 17th. This was the day that the Durbins were to be evicted from the farm that was now owned by TM Zinc's daughter, Margretta Becker. Word had spread that Sheriff Effie Rippey was on his way to carry out the eviction order, but instead hundreds of farmers gathered at the farm and threatened to shoot it out should he carry out the order. For days, the farmers took turns at the Durban farm. While some went home to care for their own farm, others would come in and take their place. Wives brought meals for their husbands, and they made it clear that the Durbins were not leaving under any circumstance. Everything reached a climax on April 27th. A large group of farmers, some reports say it was as many as 200, they went to the Beckers' home and demanded that they allow the Durbins to remain on their farm. Clarence Becker refused to give in to their demands. Next, an estimated 100 angry farmers stormed into the Lamar's courtroom of 53-year-old District Court Judge Charles C. Bradley. He immediately said, This is my courtroom. Take off your hats and stop smoking cigarettes. Suddenly, a group of men just lunged forward and grabbed the judge by his throat and legs and demanded that he not sign any additional foreclosure actions. As they issued additional demands, Bradley's face was punched and slapped, but he refused to make any promises. Infuriated, the mob just dragged the judge through the courtroom, down the hallway, and down the steps outside into the courtyard. Once again, they repeated their demands, but the judge once again refused. A group of men then loaded Judge Bradley into a truck and drove out of town as others follow behind in their vehicles. They stop when the group reached a crossroads about one and a half miles or 2.4 kilometers south of Lamar's. The judge was pulled out of the vehicle and once again the crowd made their demands. At this point, the men resumed their physical attack, but the judge refused to give in. Quote, Taken from the truck, I was blindfolded from behind by someone I did not recognize. Judge Bradley continued, Someone threw grease from a hubcap on my hair and also tossed sand in my face and hair. Then suddenly someone pulled out a thick rope and noosed it around Judge Bradley's neck. As the men lifted him up by the rope, the judge suddenly passed out and he was allowed to fall back down to the ground. He came back to about one minute later and said a prayer for the down-and-out farmers, but still refused to agree to their demands. Calls were once again made to hang the judge, and he was dragged to a nearby telephone pole. The rope was thrown up over a sign that was attached to the pole, and the ringleaders began to pull the rope tight. The crowd, however, began to argue as to whether it was better to hang the judge or to tie him to the car and drive off while dragging him behind. The judge was later quoted as saying, While I was praying, someone kept a continual tugging on the rope. Then my prayer finished, someone took my trousers down and threw grease and sand in my trousers. There were some threats of mutilation. It was at this point, for some unknown reason, that the ringleaders hopped back in their truck and they sped off. Badly beaten, Judge Bradley stood up and he started the long walk back to Lamar's. Farmers offered to give him a ride, but he turned them down. He did later accept a ride from another man who was not witness to the crime. 
Lamars was once again thrust into the national spotlight. The next day, Governor Herring issued a statement calling the attack, quote, a vicious and criminal conspiracy and assault upon a judge while in discharge of his official duties, endangering his life and threatening a complete breakdown of law and order. He made the decision to declare martial law in Plymouth County, whose county seat is Lamar's. Three National Guard companies were called in from nearby Sioux City and a fourth from Sheldon, Iowa. Additional troops responded to violence near Denison, which is located approximately 70 miles or 112 kilometers southeast of Lamar's. Even with the military presence, H.R. Schulz, who was both the co-executor of the TM Zinc estate and co-administrator of the farm from which the Durbans were being evicted, he reported that a brick had been thrown through a window of his home. Attached to that brick was a note that said, quote, If the Durbin brothers are forced to leave their farm, you and Becker will be shot on sight. A few days later, on May 2nd, the Durbin family opted to peacefully vacate the farm. It was reported on May 7th that 125 suspects had been arrested since martial law had been declared. It was also announced that Clarence Darrow, who's probably best remembered today for his defense in the famed Scopes Monkey Trial, that he would be willing to defend the arrested farmers. On May 10th, 1933, that's 12 days after he sent in the troops, Governor Herring declared an end to martial law. Reports in the press suggest that nearly all of those arrested were released and are given a small fine for their actions. Seven men were tried for their direct involvement in the attempted lynching of Judge Bradley and received sentences ranging from one to six months in duration. That seems pretty light. Clarence Darrow, who was 76 years of age at the time, did not take part in the defense of any of the men. Ultimately, on August 29, 1933, the court ruled against the Durbins. They were to pay all of the damages in full to the Zinc estate, but since the family had no money, their corn crop was to be used to pay what was owed. Ten days later, the Durbin family declared bankruptcy. As for Judge Bradley, he passed away at his home on July 26, 1939. He was 60 years old. A May 4, 1933 article in the Carroll Daily Herald was titled, Lamar's residents begin to think Zinc Estate, with its queer will, has operated as jinx to locality. They point to the Zinc Womanless Library as the first piece of evidence, the Durban Farm Uprising as the second, and the story that I'll tell you in the next podcast as a third. I'll keep the subject of that story a mystery for now. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Spry Time here in Aunt Jenny's kitchen. And it's leftover Monday again, isn't it, Aunt Jenny? Right, Danny. I've assembled what's left over from our Sunday dinner. And with delicious, nourishing Spry oatmeal muffins, there'll be just enough. Land sakes, how good hot bread does fill out of me. Oh, you bet. And how light, tender, golden, spry hot breads do round out enjoyment and add energy to a meal, too. Now, folks, try Aunt Jenny's swell spry oatmeal muffins. You'll find them extra easy to make with soft, creamy spry. Ladies, that's because it's not necessary to melt spry. Just cut it in, and you'll be delighted how quickly amazing spry blends with your other ingredients. Why, you say muffins made with pure all-vegetable spry are extra delicate in flavor, too. You get all the good nut-like flavor of the rolled oats and never the slightest off flavor... Because Spry's the shortening that stops in purity and blandness. And in these days, when every ounce of food is so urgently needed, we can't afford expensive, wasteful failures. So, ladies, rely on Spry and be sure that every bit of food you bake or fry will be eaten and enjoyed. Right. Now, folks, be listening after the story for Aunt Jenny's tip on making delicious Spry oatmeal muffins. They're swell for breakfast and plenty good as a dessert bread. That commercial for Spry Vegetable Shortening is from the May 6, 1946 broadcast of the show Aunt Jenny's Real Life Stories. 
This particular episode was titled Eric Confronts Jode. The 15-minute show ran on CBS radio from 1937 through 1956. Spry vegetable shortening was introduced by Lever Brothers in February 1936 to directly compete with Procter & Gamble's Crisco. In an effort to make a boring product more interesting, the character of Aunt Jenny was introduced to help sell the shortening. In addition to the radio show, Aunt Jenny was featured in all advertisements, Spry cookbooks, and of course in personal appearances. Marketing was so aggressive that Spry took a huge chunk of Crisco's market share. In December 1980, it was announced that Lever Brothers would stop manufacturing Spry at its Hammond, Indiana plant in January of 1981. The last supermarket ad that I could locate offering Spry for sale was dated September 15, 1981. Now, a couple of articles in December of 1981 stated that the product had been temporarily taken off the market so that the company could focus more on its Promise and Imperial Margarine product lines. Now, the article did mention that it was still being produced in 50-gallon drums at the time, but my guess is that few home bakers could use that much in a lifetime. In other news, here are a few stories on marriages that were annulled. Back in 1915, Albert F. Rudersheim married Miss Julia Mosca in Schenectady, New York. Their marriage was considered to be a happy one, but after the birth of their second child, Julia suffered a mental breakdown. As a result, she was committed to a mental institution in Utica, New York. Albert opted to head west and he landed in Denver, Colorado. While he was there, he learned through his brother that his wife had passed away, which was confirmed by a newspaper clipping. In 1924, Albert was married once again to Miss Marie Dolores Herzog, and together the couple had a baby boy. Then, in 1928, his mother, who was on her deathbed at the time, revealed that his first wife was still alive. On October 4, 1929, Albert filed papers to annul his second marriage, so he could go back and take care of his first wife and their two children. They were now aged 10 and 13. Next up, we have the marriage between Babette and Joseph Griffin, which was annulled by Superior Court Judge John C. Liu on November 20th, 1936, in Chicago. The couple had been married back in July and split up two weeks later on August 1st, shortly after leaving a movie theater in Washington, D.C. One would think that they must have had a big fight or something similar, but it was nothing like that. It turns out, while the couple was watching the movie The Great Zigfield, Bobette was shocked to see her first husband, that's Thomas W. Murray, right there up on the screen. He was in the movie. They had married in New York in 1929 and separated in 1931. Quote, in 1933, the papers carried his name as one of the killed in the Los Angeles quake. Babette continued, I was shocked. I called Murray in Hollywood. I left Washington that night. After the annulment, she planned to divorce her husband and then remarry Mr. Griffin, quote, if he still wants me. And lastly, just 12 days after the wedding between Anne Ross Birdwell and Jack Marshall, the couple received word that Jack's nephew Gene was alive and about to be released from a prisoner of war camp in Japan. The problem was that Gene was not only Jack's nephew, but he was also Anne's first husband. After receiving word the previous October that her husband had been killed on a flight over Borneo, she decided to marry her late husband's uncle but now she was in quite a pickle. Eight days after receiving the news, that was on September 7, 1945, the newlyweds had their marriage annulled by a judge in Kansas City. Anne was once again the legal wife of her first husband, that Staff Sergeant Gene D. Birdwell. Here's a question for you. Can you name the only planet in our solar system of which its day is longer than its year? 
Well, clearly it can't be Earth because one day on Earth is 24 hours and one year is 365 and one quarter days. As you already know, one day is defined as the time for a planet to rotate once on its axis. One year, on the other hand, is defined as the time for a planet to orbit around the sun. Only one planet rotates so slowly that it will have already completed its journey around that big yellow ball of energy. And that planet is, did you get it? That planet is Venus. One day on Venus is 243 Earth days, while one year is just 224.7 Earth days. So here's a few other interesting tidbits on Venus. First, did you know that Venus is the only planet that rotates in a clockwise direction? All the other planets rotate in an anti or counterclockwise direction, which means that the sun will very slowly rise in the west and set in the east on Venus. Next, Venus is the brightest planet visible in our night sky. Only the moon, which of course isn't a planet, appears brighter. It's also the hottest planet in our solar system. Its atmosphere is more than 96% carbon dioxide, causing the planet to experience the greenhouse effect to the extreme. Surface temperatures average 863 degrees Fahrenheit or 462 degrees Celsius. Lastly, all the features on Venus are named after mythical or historical women. There are only three exceptions. There's Maxwell Montes, which is a mountain range named after James Maxwell. Now, if you're not familiar with Maxwell, he's the one whose work in the mid-1800s unified electricity and magnetism for the first time and predicted the existence of radio waves on which radar is based. It was through the use of radar that scientists could see through Venus's dense atmosphere and observe that mountain range for the first time. The other two are simply called Alpha Regio and Beta Regio. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. I do hope you enjoyed the story. You can find additional true stories just like the one you heard on my website, which is uselessinformation.org, uselessinformation.org, and in the two books written by me, Steve Silverman. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Be sure to like the show on Facebook. You can do so by doing a quick search for the Useless Information podcast there. And you can also subscribe to this podcast by using your favorite podcast application. And I have to admit that most people do use iTunes. And then you'll be able to receive future episodes as soon as they come out. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.